Yes. Hello, everyone. All dogs were once puppies. So if you have a dog, you would really want to listen to what Dr. Ian Dunbar has to say about them. Welcome to the Genius Dog Challenge, the interview series. Hi there, if you're new to our channel, my name is Shanid Rohr. I'm a researcher from the Family Dog Project. And in this channel, what we're doing is researching dog behavior in live broadcast. And for this, I'm super excited to introduce to you today's guest, Dr. Ian Dunbar. Hi, Hi Dr. Ian Dunbar. How are you? Good. So, oh, sorry, that's my dog in my in the back. <laughs> we can start training right away. Yeah, well, we're talking about dogs. So, <laughs> for those of you who somehow haven't heard about Dr. Ian Dunbar, he is not only a vet and a dog behaviorist uh, expert and researcher, but also mostly known for revolutionizing the way that we train dogs today, especially in puppies. So, I want to start with a question that when I was reading your book, uh, Before and After Having Your Puppy, you, you say something about how uh, we should pay attention like to the way that puppies are socialized when they're still in their neonatal stage, when they still haven't even opened their eyes. And I'm asking, like, why would you want to socialize a puppy that can't even see you? Well, that's a very human question. You see, a dog will never ask that question. They would say, yeah, why do I want to socialize if I can't feel you, which they can, or smell you, which they can. And so the point is, uh, neonate can tell whether it's um, the breeder handling them or a stranger, whether that stranger is a male or a female, you know. And, and the whole thing is touch is the most important aspect, you know, of, of living with a dog. I mean, we want a companion dog. We want a dog to hug, you know, in the evening on the couch. And I know many owners who can't touch their own dog that they live with, or they can't uh, clean its teeth or clip its nails or groom it, which is, is just all too silly. It's, it's having a you know, a spouse that you can't go to bed with. I mean, you know, what's the point? And so socialization is everything. And the most important aspect about socialization is people and handling. You know, when you look at what are the, the main causes of dog bites, um, they are a number of, there's 13 what I call subliminal bite triggers. And these are stimuli which uh, may not cause the dog to bite on its own, but when they add up, um, they do. And eight of these are touched. The number one reason why dogs bite is because a family member reaches for its collar. You know, it's not the stories of a mad pit bull mauling a child on the street. I mean, that happens very, very occasionally, and we hear about it because it's newsworthy. But in the home, people are getting bitten by their own dogs when they just reach for the collar. Then next we'd have two ears, then the muzzle, the teeth, then four paws, the nails, then the ghoulies, you know, the rear end, hugging them, looking in their eyes. And then we'd move on to other things like valued objects and the type of person, uh, children, men, strangers being the biggest. And we want to desensitize those one by one as early as possible. So we start off with the tough ones. And by the time the puppy's eyes open, he should be like a rag doll. And that will continue um, into his adult life. Uh, I mean, so I grew up on a farm and my grandfather was an amazing guy and he classically conditioned all farm animals the first day they were born. Cows, mm -hmm. horses, pigs, sheep, chicken, cats and dogs. So you could handle them for the rest of their lives. Uh, I think that's super important. Just can we, you give us a short in cup on what is classical conditioning? Oh, classical <laughs> conditioning is, is basically associative learning. You know, the traditional classical conditioning comes from Pavlov that you ring a bell and then you let the dog, um, you know, smell and taste meat powder. So eventually it salivates with the ring of the bell. 
But that's just a one example with a reflex. But basically, it's how dogs form predictive associations. Okay, and, and for what this... dogs to realize is when they see a person, good things are going to happen. And so, yes. for the first few months, when uh, anyone comes to your house, um, of course, these days we have to set it up outside with our friends, you know, 20 friends spacing out and walking around the block uh, mm -hmm. clockwise and you walk clockwise with the dog. Every time you see a person, a pretend stranger approaching, you say, oh, look, there's a person, treat, treat, treat. And so from then on, when the dog sees the person, he says, oh, great, treat people. I love them. <laughs> so you're conditioning your dog to associate those people who have nice happy things happening it, around yeah it's the most powerful form of conditioning there is and of course dogs will form associations with training and the mm -hmm. training so if they enjoy training it's largely reward based the dog says man i love training i love learning and i love my trainer but <laughs> if you're doing some you know frightening stuff the dog says mm -hmm. you know I don't like training. I might do it because you're forcing me, but I'm not happy. And I don't really like you. And that's very sad when the you, I think, is the dog's human companion. Yeah, of course. And you say, like, what you said here could also be for rehabilitation. So in your point of view, what's the difference between rehabilitating an adult dog and socializing a puppy? Um, can you hang on two seconds? I'm on uh, being recorded. <laughs> I don't know who it is. I'm on um, so, it's a very funny question because on the, the picture you have of me um, in the opening, the big red dog, mm -hmm. um, his name was Claude, and we rescued him when he was about 10 years old. He bit everybody. Um, he was a nice dog with dogs, but he was an adult dog. Um, and we had to socialize him, which then took um, a, a, a long time, but the techniques were exactly the same as um, you would do with puppies. You know, mm -hmm. the techniques are the same, it's just I'll give you the time course. You know, say you pick up a, a puppy that's shy in um, puppy class, I want to resolve mm -hmm. it before the end of the hour. If, on the other hand, I don't pick him up till he's five months old and he's shy, it's going to take several months. Mm -hmm. If he's eight months old and shy of people, it may take a couple of years. The techniques are the same. It's all classical conditioning, but puppies are just so receptive. They're so You can change their behavior and temperament so easily. I mean, this was actually a finding that came from a research on dogs. Quite by the by, we were researching the development of aggression and social hierarchies in dogs. And one puppy was a nasty puppy, had a horrible temperament. He was bellicose, picking fights, growling, bullying other dogs. And his temperament changed, wham, pretty much overnight. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow, because back then, I'm ashamed to say 50 years ago, the current <laughs> opinion was that temperament was immutable you couldn't change it but it was caused by genetic heredity well we just proved that wrong and when i saw this before my eyes i thought wouldn't breeders and people be interested in this and so when i started serious puppy training the way i advertised it to veterinarians that i'd get referrals is this is temperament training so we look at the puppy's temperament and we mold it. We build its confidence. We knock it down a bit if he's a bully or too hyperactive. So we're creating a really solid, confident, friendly dog. And straight away, the, the, the puppy school was just an outrageous success because of that, because now vets could handle the adult dogs that came in. Mm -hmm. And do you think the reason that puppies are so easy to train has probably something to do with brain plasticity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just neonatally, you've got tens of millions of neurons which are just dying off. This period of what we call apoptosis, when if neurons are not used, then they die. The synapses wither and eventually the cells die. At the same time, 
if a cell, if a neuron is used, then more synapses are made, more connections. And this happens, and, and this is the reason I, I came to the States to uh, do research at Berkeley, because of two research studies, Dr. Beat studying behavior, the sort of uh, endocrinology of behavior, and then the Diamond Rosenweig study on brain plasticity, um, is the fact that experience, or if you like, behavior, changes the neuroanatomy. It actually changes the anatomy of the brain. And more recently, I, I read up on this, I, I bought some textbooks about four years ago, this change is instantaneous. So as you pet a neonate, the little dendritic spines are moving like this, like an elephant's trunk, and then blop, they plug into another cell and create a synapse. That happens as you pet the animal. This stuff, the waste, the waste <laughs> of cells that we cause by doing nothing to a dog, just keeping it in a cage at the kennel. And, and Mark Rosenzweig, who was the uh, one of the lead researchers on that, he said, you know, the study of laboratory animals or captive animals is basically a study of brain damaged animals. Mm -hmm. And I f this is something that I think a lot of trainers talk a lot about socialization. Mm -hmm. But in my point of view, from reading a lot of studies about um, development also in lab animals, I think we're maybe looking at this in a bit of a narrow um, view because there is also a lot of the concept of the brain development. So I would like to hear your opinion about this, that maybe when we are socializing a puppy, what we're actually doing is teaching him how to learn. So it's not only the fact that we're socializing him to meet Anna, to meet different people. It's actually the fact that we're teaching him how to learn. And physically, as you said, we're changing the structure of its brain. So mm -hmm. later, it will be able to learn. Absolutely. And the learning starts um, very early on, one to two day old neonates. Same thing with babies. Human, ba you know, if we say there's two types of conditioning, classical conditioning or associative learning, that this leads to that. So a person coming in the room means I'm going to be picked up and hugged. Okay. Then we have operant conditioning when the behavior is changed by its consequences and the consequences largely pleasant, one hopes, occasionally unpleasant. This learning takes place um, with day old neonates. They can, number one, make associations between fuzzy faces with people or smells of people and good things happening. I'm going to be stroked. But also, um, their behavior calming a neonate uh, becomes an operant conditioning. Now, the interesting thing is here, as we do this, and we change the animal's brain very early on, it starts training us. And I would say most babies and most puppies at four weeks of age are much better trainers than 99.99% .99 of dog owners that I've seen. Most dogs, most puppies can change the behavior of people. And if you think about it, the rewards they use are massive. It's a little puppy who goes, Oh. <laughs> you know, there's the reward that they can get owners to do anything they want. They by, by the time they're eight weeks old, they have trained the owner to be a a, uh, a cook, a chauffeur, a doorman, a, uh, a you know, to carry them, to pick them up, to stroke them, a masseur. They've trained the human all these functions to make my life as a puppy darn sight more enjoyable because my owners are so trainable. And, and then and I heard it because I, I can communicate with dogs, you know, and the other day I was chatting to my dogs here and they said, you know, the best humans are trainable, the easiest trained, most lovable humans, Hungarians. They are fantastic. They, they really are. Okay. <laughs> I'm not Hungarian, but we definitely have here Sorry. a lot of very, very good dog trainers. I wanted to ask you, because 
socialization is such an important thing. But now I think we're going to have like this post-COVID year puppies that were born over the last year. So do you have any suggestions for people that are now under quarantine, they cannot leave their house, how they can still somehow try to, to socialize their dogs, even though they are stuck at home? Yeah, I mean, I, I got loads of suggestions. As soon as COVID broke out, I thought, wow, there's going to be a lot of adult biting dogs in the future. So we made a whole bunch of webcasts that we um, put up on, on DunbarAcademy.com. And we're now moving these so they ha have easier access, so they're free to, to anyone. So number one, my view about socialization is whatever the constraints on it, because the, the constraints used to be the puppet's health. Remember, the vets used to say, don't socialize your puppy till he's had his shots. Well, that is just downright stupid and ridiculous, and they obviously haven't thought about it. No, I don't think we should take the puppy to places which are dangerous, like a vet clinic parking lot, or have it on the floor in a vet clinic waiting room, the two most dangerous places in the world for an unvaccinated puppy, but you can bring the people to the kennel. You can bring the people to the puppy's home. And in my book, as you've read, I say 100 people should come to the kennel to handle the puppy there prior to eight weeks. And then in the next month, in the new home, 100 people could come in. Now the constraints on socialization are not just puppy health, but human health. So my brain immediately says, well, how can we do this? Well, number one, let's bring in several sensory modalities of people into the home. The people can't come themselves into your home, but they can mail, say, used T-shirts so the puppy can smell them, you know, underarm, and then the owner feeds them loads of treats. So the puppy says, God, I love that smell. And then six months hence, when we get back to normal, Joe comes to visit, you know, father-in-law or son, and the puppy recognizes him immediately. Oh, you're the treat for smell. I know you. Uh, we can Zoom with puppies or StreamYard with puppies. So they can see the sort of fuzzy shapes of people, but hear their voices while owners then reward them. But, you know, there's loads we can do outside as well. As I said, invite 20 people. And these are people who will be part of the dog's core social group of people when he's an adult. People who you want your dog to enjoy and feel confident around and get along with. So we invite them all. They come outside your house. They spread out. They're all spacing. They're all wearing masks. And they walk around the block spaced out by 20, uh, say, by 10 meters each. You walk around with the dog in the opposite direction. And every time you see this stranger coming, because it's not a stranger, these are people you know and they know what to do, the person stands still. So you then approach with the dog and sit the dog two meters away and say, hey, this is Joe. Yeah, good dog. Say hello. Then the dog goes to the length of his leash plus the length of your arm, which is three meters, and the stranger says, come and sit. And when the dog's sitting, they handle it. And then we go on round. Well, each lap, you're going to meet 20 people. You do 10 laps, that's 200 greetings with the same people, the very people you want your dog to like. So there are ways to do it. We just mm -hmm. can't have lots of people close together unmasked. But that doesn't stop us socializing puppies. And we shouldn't because the effects are terrible. Terrible, yeah. nothing worse than to be scared. There's nothing worse to be anxious or stressed. And then the owner takes you places and you have to meet your biggest nightmare every day of your life, people. It, mm -hmm. it is the cruelest thing we do to dogs, not socialize them. You know, yeah. it, it, it's one of the few things that I'm a very easygoing person. And when people say me, tell me stupid things about training, I, I just nod and smile and say, yeah, that used to be a way of doing it 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now we do it quicker, you know, and, and more effective. But when someone says to me, oh, oh yeah, she's shy. And I say, mm -hmm. well, what's she doing about it? Oh, she'll grow out of it. No, she won't. Mm -hmm. It won't even remain the same. It will get worse every week that goes by. It, I, I really have to contain myself and say, mm -hmm. don't you understand how much your dog is in pain and yeah. you're ignoring it. And actually, maybe now 
that so of us are unfortunately at home, closed at home. Well, we have the time to do this. So maybe even if you specifically have a dog that is shy, this could be your time to try and socialize it. And I guess the, the methods that you mentioned here for puppies could also work on adult dogs just much more carefully. It, it's actually funny. I, I spend more time now because socialization is so easy. And as you say, there is so much time available while we are sequestering at home. I now caution people about, you've also got to prepare your puppy for being left at home alone. Because when mm -hmm. this is over and you go back to work, your puppy is going to freak out and have an anxiety attack, you know? So we must prepare the puppy now. And, and I do it like my dogs now, um, they were all on downtime, individually in crates. This is a training school. Mm -hmm. uh, train assistance dogs for veterans with the PTSD. So crate time, then I went in, I let them out. So now they're having a little play time on their own. Um, but then when I finish this, I'll take them one by one and they have to have a quiet time on their own, just for an hour, just so I know they can do it. And I'll give them a stuffed chew toy so they grow to enjoy it now, but they'll be hidden in the part of the house while I'm working with the other dogs. It, it, it's so important. The socialization bit is easy, but what is difficult to get people to do is teach their puppy to enjoy little quiet moments on its own. Instead, they want to smother it with attention and they're kind of killing it with kindness because when they go back to work and the kids go back to school, that poor puppy is just going to have the most terrible of times. Yeah. Okay, so I want to thank you so much. I hope I learned a lot from this. I really hope that all our viewers also took a lot from this. Work with your dogs, especially now. <laughs> we have the time now, so do it now. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Number. Thank you so much for asking me and hello to everybody out there, to anyone who's watching. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I wish we'd talked a bit about the Genius Dog Challenge though. That's <laughs> that I'm, yeah, I'm so yeah. So it's really the, the Genius so Dog you. Challenge is, if you haven't heard about it and you're sitting at home and listening to us, this is where we trained dogs to, uh, we took dogs that already knew the names of objects and we were trying to push the limit of how fast they can learn the names of new objects. So if you're new to our channel, definitely go check up the last broadcast that we have. I promise you it's going to blow your mind how Hi, I'm back. <laughs> how fast and how amazing these dogs have learned the names of objects. And the challenge itself has is over but we are still going to keep uploading lots of new exciting experiments and interviews with definitely the most, as you've seen, known and famous people and influential people in the dog uh, society. So thank you, the, uh, Dr. Dunbar, and thank you at home for being with us. We will see you in the next broadcast. Bye.